Hello, Geekon. So, it's 2.10, so it looks like it's time to start. Um, first things first, it's great to see you um, second time in a row. Um, and I really won't be lying right now, it's one of my favorite conferences I've ever been to. Um, so I feel really privileged that I can be here. Um, my name is Grzegorz Piwowarek. Um, I'm a lead software engineer at Kasumo on Malta. Um, more lead than engineer recently. Um, you can find me doing trainings all around the place and also blogging at forcomprehension.com. If you need my Twitter, you can find me there as well. One of the most important things for now is that you can ask questions through slido.com. And if we have enough time, at the end, I will try to answer all of them. So, the main topic for today is immutability. Um, I would like to tell you a story about immutability. Um, nowadays, it became actually quite fashionable to, to do that in the Java world. And I think it's a, probably one of the best things that happened to OOP and Java in recent years, at least regarding trends. Um, but immutability has its cost. It simplifies a lot of stuff, but it also makes certain things much more difficult to implement. And my job for today will be to highlight those concerns to make you aware that at the end of the day, um, you can make a conscious choice when to go immutable and when it doesn't really make sense. Um, let's have a look at this very simple method signature. We have a method called transform. It accepts a list of strings. It also returns a list of strings. So what do you think? What can, could it possibly do? Nothing. Maybe adds a value, maybe uppercases all those strings, whatever. Um, but when you are thinking about this particular problem, well, you probably don't even imagine things that are in there. So what it turns out is that actually the input list is modified. We add some value from some internal state. Then I add some constant taken out of thin air. Then I order a pizza. Um, then I verify if there is a correct moon phase, then remove a 7. Um, then add even more state, uh, mutate some mutable fields, and, well, this is often what you can see if you... Um, this is how student uh, home projects often look like. Um, the big problem with that is that um, we, when we were seeing the method signature, we wouldn't even think that something like this could happen. And if we write code using a lot of techniques involving mutability, side effects, it's much harder to reason about it. Because suddenly, if you look at the, at the simple name of a method, you see its inputs, you see outputs, and suddenly it does, you have certain expectations. But then, suddenly, it turns out it does so much things. And then, if you actually want to navigate such code, you need to be somehow able to reconstruct the whole state of what's going on in there and be able to navigate through it. But there's a problem because our heads are limited. There is a limited number of the memory space where you can pack up with, with the current context. Um, and if there's a problematic, um, it makes things very hard. Um, but if we apply, let's say, mutability and other defensive programming techniques to it, suddenly things become much easier because you don't need to reconstruct a huge state in your head, instead just a small piece of it. And then you construct other small contexts and you compose them together and things start working. Um, so immutability is a great tool that helps us in minimizing the number of invalid states well, things can have. So let's have a look at this very simple user class. It's fully mutable. It has fields like name, surname, phone, whatever. Um, but there is no documentation. So the question is, how do we use it? Because it's some form of public API, possibly. So is name op optional or not? Is phone optional? I mean, what's the combination of things I can use there? And you can start seeing that the more mutable fields you, you keep adding, you increase the number of potential invalid states that, well, your code can be in. In other words, there, there are way more ways you can break your leg with than if this stuff was mutable, immutable. Um, if you remember 
how it used to be to work with Java Util Date. You probably know this very well. Um, as Tomek Nurkiewicz would call it, it, it was very interesting to work with this one. Um, so if we go immutable and dedicate and write design APIs that are that minimize the number of ways we can kill ourselves with, that's a huge benefit. And this is immutability, immutability is great for that. But besides this, once we go immutable, we can it opens us some space for applying multiple optimizations. So imagine you have a list cons uh, consisting of one, two, and three. Um, and if this is immutable, it can be fully shared um, and memorized. So if you have, let's say, another piece of code which, which uses, well, the list with one, two, and three, it can reuse exactly the same object because it can't be changed, which opens a really nice space for optimizations. Plus, uh, if you have immutable objects, well, if you create an immutable list, you know it can't change. So you can pre-compute, let's say, a hash, its size, or many other things. So there are a few low-hanging fruits uh, that we can benefit from. Um, what's also quite interesting is that um, in certain cases, you can totally like, revolutionize certain implementations. So if you have a look at immutable uh, implementations of collections that arrived in JDK 9, um, they are not really bugged by arrays or any data structures. In most cases, you know, if you instantiate a list of two elements, this is essentially just two fields. Why bother with an array if you essentially know that you always store just two elements? This is pretty cool. Um, but let's go back for a second and revise what does it mean, what's, what immutable means at least um, just by using words of Brian Getz from um, concurrency in practice. So an immutable object is when its state cannot be modified after construction, all its fields are final, and this reference doesn't escape during construction, because, let's say, other threads can observe it in an invalid state. So now, here's the question. Is string an immutable class? Who thinks that string is immutable? No one? Well, a few of them. OK, I know, I, I know it's a tricky question. Um, so let's have a look at the string it, itself. Um, inside, it has at least three fields. Two of them are a final, but there is one non-final field. Well, so as you can see, it doesn't, satisfy, doesn't really satisfy the definition that Brian Getz provided. Plus, it actually can be modified after construction. So, so what's going on? Were we lied to for all years that string is immutable? Well, actually, all of us were right, because string is both immutable and immutable. It just depends on what abstraction layer do you look at. Uh, so string obviously is immutable. But if we have a look at the, a, from the consumer API perspective, but nothing prevents such tools to be actually mutable internally for certain optimizations or, or other things. Um, and actually, even if you really want to be um, evil, well, you can always, at the end of the day, do something really bad and access what you shouldn't be accessing. So what I would like to think about is that nothing is really fully immutable. We can only discuss immutability at certain abstraction layers. At the end of the day, everything is being run on a machine that, that's mutable. Well, maybe someday they will figure out machines that will be immutable, that will just bubble up that if you push a button on a keyboard, then anyone will bubble up from that. I hope not. That would be a lot of mess. Um, what's more, I'm, I bet that most of you heard that immutable objects are thread safe. But apparently, it's not always the case. And what's interesting is that thread safety is actually used as one of the more biggest selling points of immutability. There are certain corner cases where immutable objects can be not thread safe. And here, technically, you can argue if objects were actually fully immutable if they were not safe, thread safe in certain scenarios. But those are issues that you need to be aware of. Because, for example, in Scala, I think 2.10, there was a bug for quite a long time. You, there was a possibility for other threads to observe, let's say, a vector of one element to be in an invalid state. If I remember correctly, it was caused because um, head or tail element was mutable and non-volatile. 
So this, this, this got fixed, um, but it can happen. So um, be aware of that. So since we know that um, we are discussing immutability at the API level, let's spend um, a second about well, talking about the design of immutable APIs and use Java util list by example. So as you notice, in Java, we already got some certain unmodifiable or immutable classes. Um, but they still need to conform to our well, common, commonly known interface from collections API. So immutable classes can't be really modified, right? So, but we still need to implement mutable methods. So what can we do? Well, we can just throw an exception and say unsupported operation exception. This is a very easy implementation, but not so user-friendly. Because suddenly it turns out that you, as a consumer, you would need to probably be aware of what a particular implementation you are working with. Or at least try catch exceptions defensively, uh, which is not a very nice thing to do. Um, but what we could do to actually make it more usable? We would need to rewrite a bit all of those APIs, and instead of returning, well, either nothing, or maybe uh, some metadata or information if object was inserted or not, we could instead spawn a new instance of, of a list or any collection containing the modification that we asked for. So it's not really modif modif modification of what's internally, but more like deriving a new values from what we have there. Um, and this is actually key to having a user-friendly APIs for immutable structures. You still expose mutable operations, but uh, they don't really mutate anything but give you a new copy containing the change you really wanted to. But let's have a look at this for a while. So if you look at each implementation there, um, each of them starts with copy, copy, copy. That's quite a lot of copying and quite a lot of iterating. Um, which means this will be probably very inefficient. And this turns out that this is apparently the case. Because if you look at projects, let's say, written in, in Haskell, although they, are, they did quite a lot of things to mitigate the problem, they still end up producing quite a lot of garbage. One gigabyte data per second, that's quite a lot and quite a huge stress for a garbage collector. And this is how we arrive to the main topic of today, which is um, persistent data structures. Um, and now we might have a, let's say, a clash, because some of you, when, he, when you hear persistent, you imagine persistence from the bounded context of, let's say, data, databases, persistent storages. But the persistence, what we'll be talking about today, is persistence in the context of collections. So we will be discussing collections that can somehow preserve their previous versions after getting mutated. And there are a few ways to achieve that. And this should be probably the main, the, the actual title of the talk. But purely functional data structures are both immutable and persistent. And, well, let's be honest, they, they form a better title. But it's essentially the same. Um, so the thing to remember, they, person data structures, they always preserve the previous version. They never destroy it in any way. And there are a few ways that we can achieve this. First one, we've seen already. That would be brute force copying on just of the content of the collection and just, just returning this. But this is pretty inefficient, so we want to do better. Um, another option is to use the real, uh, leverage the concept called fat nodes which essentially means that if you create a data structure, it would store internally um, a history of changes. And you can think about this as, as event sourcing for collections. But this is pretty much like memory leaks, huge memory leaks on demand. So that's another not very feasible option. And the last one that turns out to be quite practical is structural sharing. So the whole idea that we'll be exploring today is how to design immutable data structures um, by minimizing the amount of elements we need to actually copy and maximizing reuse of those that are already there. And this is actually quite tricky. So far, there's been quite many talks about the subject, and they touch it from many different points of view. 
I really like the talk by Paul Sandos from uh, Oracle Code One last year or two years ago, where the introduction was five minutes and then 40 minutes of live coding of hashed array mapped tries. I, but I really liked the presentation of Oleg Shelayev as well, where he went through like the also low-level implementation details, but also showed the theory behind uh, how to assess uh, amortized time complexity of such data structures. But the real reason why I included this slide is that at the beginning of his talk, he introduced the concept of, a, of, a, of the unicorn. It's, it's a very cartoonish, it's, it's fluffy, it, there, is, there are rainbows. And the truth is that I believe that this image is not very accurate. Because what we are actually trying to do here is not create a beautiful, um, beautiful recursive data structures that, that perform well, but more like desperately trying to regain some of the performance that mutable data structures had. So once we know, now we know what percent data structures is. So let's get back to this poor string class that we know. So persistent data structures, they preserve previous versions. Um, string is immutable. We have, um, we have them actually memorized in an object uh, string pool. Um, but we still have quite a lot of mutating operations on the string class itself. So certainly some of them cause certain copying, but you can see that those ideas are actually used in the JDK itself. So whenever you, call, whenever you create a substring of a given string, it's not like there is a new string being copied and returned, but instead the whole value of the string is passed forward, but a, a view is created a narrow view on the whole um, string data structure, which is pretty cool and quite efficient. It's all around the place. Um, but unfortunately, similar ideas were also used not only to imm immutable structures. You can see the same pattern being used, let's say, um, for, for lists. So there is this method, sublist, um, which works Pretty much the same as substring is just replace string with uh, replace string with a list. So the sublist is not really a copy of the of the data structure containing only elements between those two indexes, um, but it's actually a view over a list, and this can cause really bad problems if you if you don't track where where those data structures are passed around. So the real problem I've seen in certain tests is that, well, we had a list of numbers. Um, we were transforming them multiple times using Guava transformers. If you don't remember this, this is like streams just pre-Java 8. Um, then we were modifying it, shuffling it. And then it turns out that actually it's all the same, the same list with same elements. Because the Guava transformers, they don't return, they return copies as well. They return a view, mutating view that accesses the data that's in the original list, but applies the function that you pass to it. And this is terrible, because we were using this um, for some randomized tests to make sure that we pick certain values um, from a collection using this. And well, the test would always pass, which was quite cool. They were pretty useless, because they would assert if, let's say, first two elements were always a part of the same list, which is always true, which is kind of bad. Um, so this is when we can actually start having a look at how to design classes that are, that are persistent. So the most canonical example that we can look at is a singly linked list. And, but this is not the linked list you learned on your university, you know, just nodes connected with pointers to each other. This is a bit more tricky. You still, each node of the list contains actually a, an element but it also contains a pointer, I mean a reference, to the previous version of the list. So the whole data structure by itself is actually recursive. So if you create an empty, empty list, you add, and you want to add another item there, um, you actually never modify anything. You create a new list, you point to the previous one in there, and you return the new one. Thanks to this, you can fully share the previous versions that were up there. So lists never contain more than one element, but more like a recursive, recursively point to smaller versions or previous versions to themselves. 
And you can see that this is indeed the case. Let's take a very simple example and create a list containing one element. Let's add one more element straight into this. And now you can see that we have two lists that are actually uh, immutable. The first one wasn't modified. Um, and you can see that um, the second one actually points at the first one. So we managed to avoid mindless copying and leverage sharing. sharing. OK? So there is not that much of a trade-off in this particular case. And as you can see, the prepend looks just create new object, pass the old version, add an element. Perfect. Works. Um, and what's more, we still manage to main maintain the constant time for insertion and access time, which is pretty cool. But OK, this is what happens if you add elements from one side to the list. But what if we want to append from, from the other one? It's not so easy right now, OK? Because if we start from the right side, we just keep, just remove the element, just add a new element on top of it. It's constant. But if we want to add from the other side, there is no a single element that we can just remove or add. We pretty much need to peel off the whole data structure one by one till we get to, to zero and start recreating it from scratch. And this is terrible, because this is, this is not constant time anymore, it's linear. And so it's not really nice. However, it's acceptable for, for certain lists, so we can somehow um, live, live with that. But before we go to another one, I'd like to touch upon a very interesting topic, um, because we often hear that immutable structures are thread safe. Let's assume that in this particular scenario, we are talking on about implementations that are actually thread safe. But if someone tries to tell you and sell you the idea that immutability gives you thread safety and makes you stop worrying about concurrency, I feel like this is someone is not telling the full truth. Um, the way I see this is that I remember the story that my mom used to tell me um, about King Midas and his golden touch. So to give you a brief overview, be aware of the spoilers, sorry. Um, King Midas wanted to have this nice skill about, and so that he could turn everything he touched into gold. And this seems like a very, very useful skill to have, I think. Um, the problem was that once he started trying to eat or touch his relatives, they would also turn into gold. So not that useful after all. And this is a bit the case with immutable structures, because usually when I see discussions about persistent data structures and we paint this picture of a singly linked list and uh, this recursiveness, there's always someone asking a question where, what if we have two different threads and they start modifying it at the same time and one takes it here and the second doesn't add it, do they see updates? Um, I don't really know why this is, why this is uh, a very common question, because, well, this is an immutable data. So each thread that jumps in and modifies it, it will derive the value in its, well, in its own context. Um, those updates are not shared in any possible way. Um, it's, like, it's like we had, you know, let's say, it's like we all tried to do some calculations and modified, let's say, commonly known numbers. That would be, that would be really weird and very hard to work with. So if you really want to use a persistent or immutable data structure in a way, you know, as a form of a concurrent collection when you actually use to share updates, um, well, then you put it somewhere in the center of your application, and you need to manually manage and synchronize access to it. Um, so, so much for the easiness of concurrency. What's more, this won't scale because you have one big contention point in the center there. Um, Maybe for the list, it's not that terrible, but imagine a map. If you use a concurrent hash map, the locking is very fine-grained. The locking will happen per bucket, will be kind of distributed. But if you want to do the same with an immutable map, you bring all the contention into one point, which, kind, which is not ideal. Um, so maybe in such cases, it's worth revisiting if it only, if it, if, the immutable, if being pure and immutable makes actually sense, maybe it makes sense to use a well-tested and battle-proven mutable concurrent data structure. 
or maybe consider a different way of sharing updates. You can, for example, send immutable messages with updates. That's another option. And actually, the same pattern applies to any immutable structure. So if someone asks, well, how do you deal, uh, deal with updates when working with persistent data structures, just, just imagine like you would work with shared string. If you want to have you share an update, well, you need to do pretty much the same, which kind of doesn't really make sense. Um, some of you might actually think that, well, technically we could avoid the locking, we could go lock free with compare and swap, um, but there's another problem. Because if you have n threads jumping in and making changes concurrently, well, they will get their own copies of their collections. And, on, and one minus one will not succeed and just throw those copies at, at garbage collector, which is not really nice. Um, so, we've seen already how to create our own, well, ideally persistent list. It was quite simple. Let's see what we could do in order to implement our own persistent set. Well, we could use a list, right? Internally. Duh. Well, we could. That would work. But it would be highly inefficient. Because we have a different access patterns for, for we expect different access patterns for a set than for a list. Um, so could we do possibly something much smarter than just putting a list there? Well, we could use a tree. Trees also have this very nice property that they are actually recursive. So if you start removing elements from the root, each of the nodes actually starts a new subtree. So there's a huge potential for um, structure sharing. Um, but it gets a bit more trickier, because this will still involve quite a lot of copying. Imagine that this is a, a typical BST, and you want to add a 42 number straight into it. You add it at the bottom, um, but whoops, it actually triggers a modification that bubbles up straight to the root. And you actually need to copy everything that's along the way and you can't avoid it. But luckily, you can actually avoid copying everything that you have not on the path. So that's pretty cool. There is still huge potential for, for sharing. OK, and what do we do with a queue? Well, actually, linked list implements a queue, right? So we should be able to do that. Make sense? Yes. Um, the problem is that, as we already saw, the way we implement a singly linked list, persistent singly linked list, it actually works, it has a very nice, it has constant time access from one side, but from the other it's linear, which is, which is really bad. And the way we use a queue is that usually we put something, some things to the one side and take from the other. So this doesn't make sense at all. But that would work really nice as a, as a proper stack, where you put on the one side and take from the same side. Um, so once we know that queues exhibit totally different access patterns, what could we do to implement, well, a really nice queue? Well, there is a very interesting solution to this problem. Because imagine, if we have a list that, uh, that we can append to very fast from one side, um, but we can, what well, is very slow from the other side, well, technically, we could take two lists, reverse them, put them together, and you get a queue. That's a, that might sound like a very dumb solution, but it actually does the job. So, and this is how it's implemented in, in Scala or in Waver and in many others. Um, so if you want to see how it looks like, well, creation of a new list is pretty much, well, you accept internally you accept two lists that serve as two parts of the queue. Um, the only tricky part is that you need to remember that at some point, you need to actually reverse one list um, and put it, those elements in the front. And look, um, this can be problematic a bit, because you can see if you add the values, if you just add, add prepend values to the queue, it's very easy. If you, if you dequeue, it's also very easy. And this is constant time. But from time to time, in that situation, we're going to reverse a list, which is linear, which is not ideal. Um, so at this point, we can do a bit of um, some sophisticated math and prove that this is actually amortized constant time. Uh, amortized constant time means that this is constant time, but not really. Uh, which means that um, 
the operation of reversing a list is performed so infrequently that we can kind of distribute it over other operations and think of it as effectively constant time. Well, naturally, this is optimistic is constant, but pessimistic is on ON, and we need to remember about this. Um, because it will work fine in our business layer, but if you're developing real-time systems, probably you can't afford this kind of latency jumps. But could we do something even smarter? Because this one can be considered, well, pretty dumb solution. Um, notice how I say smarter, not necessarily better. Um, we could use a tree over again. So the way, the one of the approaches that we can use here is to leverage the concept of two free finger tree. Uh, just to remind you, two free tree is a tree that can have two or three branching factor. And now, if we put all our no values only on one level and create a lot of internal nodes all around the place, um, this will work. This will work as a sequence, uh, but we still kind of don't have constant time access to the beginning and to the, till the end, because it, it's uh, logarithmic, right? So what very smart thing we can do at that moment? We could grab those internal nodes that are close to the ends and pull them up, creating something like this. And this is what two finger tree is about. We take a two three tree, we catch those nodes that are close to the end, we pull them up to the root, and now we have a constant time access to those elements. Well, we can access them in constant time, but it gets a bit more tricky if you want to modify it, because this is where the path copying and all these things kick in, and it can be slow at times. So one of the optimizations that, that people sometimes do is that they actually pull out more nodes straight into the, uh, more nodes straight into the root so that they can access it without jumping through multiple, uh, multiple nodes. But again, at the end of the day, this is not real constant time, but amortized constant time. Um, but here comes the very important question. So if this solution is so smart and actually fits the, the, the queue, actually it's not only a queue, it's a double-ended queue, uh, why other languages use the bunker's queue, which is this well, so-called dumb solution with two lists? It turns out that actually insertions and removal are quite cheaper on the bunker's queue. What's more, if you have a look at this image over there, you can see a lot of nodes, a lot of empty nodes all around the place. So in the root, you have pointers to data structures, having pointers to nodes that are empty and have pointers to values. So there's so much in direction that it turns out it has terrible locality because those values end up lying pretty much all around the place. I remember when I first time read about this, I, I wanted to implement this for, for Java Slang waiver. Um, and, and I ran there, I thought, oh guys, you implemented the queue only with two, with two lists, and look, what, what, smart, what smart thing can I do? Yeah, and this is where I got slapped. No, 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 that's a bad idea. Um, but actually, other languages use it. This is, for example, how sequences are represented in Haskell but you don't need to use them as queues, because as queues, they won't perform good enough. Um, but they are, they are still useful. And this is slowly where we arrive to probably one of the most interesting ones, which is how to implement a persistent map. Um, and you probably can expect that implementing any bad performing one is not really, not really something hard. You put a list with entries and, well, it's a map, right? Works. Too bad, well, the advantages is that it does the job. The bad side of it is really terribly slow and you can't really have a proper hash map in this case. But we really need a hash map. We need to try to come up with a solution that kind of performs at least, at least resembles hash map in some, at least a bit. And it turns out that we can do something smarter. Um, it's called the hash array mapped try and is widely used in many different languages. You can find it in Scala, Haskell, Clojure, Waver, and, and multiple implementations in GitHub. For those of you that, just a reminder, this is not a typo. 
it's a try, not a tree, which is a bit kind of different data structure. Um, so what a tree is, is what a try is, sorry, um, it's often referred to something like a radix tree, uh, which is this very, which is a data structure which pretty much resembles uh, some form of um, deterministic uh, state machines, where you, where each transition represents some form of a prefix. So if you go down and down and down for each node, it helps you figure out prefixes, for example, for strings. And this is, for example, how, I don't know if Google works like this, probably not, but they could if they wanted to. Because you transist from one node to another, you already know what the prefix is and explore all possible values that, that we store there further, which is pretty cool. Um, and this is where something really smart kicks in. Because it turns out we can actually have a data structure that performs quite close to a hash map. It won't be never as good as the, the pure hash map, but it's getting close. This is where hash array mapped try kicks in. So if you imagine this try data structure that store prefixes, well, what if we take this idea and instead of storing arbitrary strings, we stay hash codes of our objects? but let's encode them in using binary representations. It could work, and now what we could do is to put in every possible node an array, and this array would be in there. We would put another node there using indexes formed by those parts of the hash code that are represented the whole, uh, in the whole try. And it's super smart. Um, and it works, actually, surprisingly good. Um, what's really bad about this is that when you work with this kind of data structures and you have an arrays that are always there, will contain a lot of null values. Um, this is bad. This is not very memory efficient. But it turns out that we can do something with that. Um, so one of the if and again, we know that this is immutable. So we can employ some additional uh, optimizations to deal with that. So if we know, let's say, that our, our array in each node of a hash try has, let's say, only two elements, we could create a separate bitmap that would represent the locations um, of, those, of those elements. And then we don't need to allocate the whole array and fill it with nulls. We can allocate exactly what we need, which is quite great. Um, by the way, this is the moment where you probably should be asking questions. Um, how is that performing near the hash map? Because it's clearly a tree, a form of a tree. And if you do lookups in a tree, that's not constant, that's, that's logarithmic. And this is where the very cool thing kicks in. So usually those form of data structures, they have a very huge branching factor. So if they have a branching factor of those arrays internally, they will have, let's say, by default, let's say, 32 elements. And such a data structure would have a fixed depth. So we would be st storing all values or, or terminal nodes on, let's say, the level 6. And look, so at each level, we store, let's say, 30 t 32 elements. And those point to other nodes that store 32 elements. And they do the same and the same and the same. So it turns out that by having only six levels of depth in such data structures, we can store quite a lot, because the number turns out, after, after you sum up and see how many elements it can store, it turns out it's bigger than the integer size. Um, OK, but let's assess now um, actual time complexity of this one. Because Yes, you, you got me here. It's not a constant time. It's logarithm base 32 uh, from n. But, OK, let's actually substitute the n with our actual values. So let's try to do a lookup for the hash array map try that's as big as integer max value. And that's around, that's a bit more than 6, which is pretty good which is not constant, but still, if you, have, you can do everything in six or seven hops, that's, that's quite a nice result. And to give you a, some intuition how slowly this value progresses, let's take well, the, the long size, and then that's 13, and the difference is 
incredible. Um, actually, it turns out that this data structure is widely used not only in the persistent setup. There are multiple other very interesting explorations of this one. Um, and they are not on, they, they won't be immutable. They will be concurrent and embracing mutability. And there is so much to learn from those white papers. This one, for example, cache aware log free concurrent hash tries, is from Martin Oderski and other guys from EPFL. I recommend re read this because you can learn uh, a lot. What's, what I told you when discussing two finger free, freeze, uh, trees, it turns out they had, they had very bad cache locality. So another a very problem, a huge problem that everyone's trying to solve is to how to make them cache aware. So there's quite a lot of investigation going on. Well, how could we, what could we do with those super smart structures so that they are not thrown away uh, everywhere, but at least, at least be packed together? And this is incredibly interesting discussions to read how to, how to overcome those problems. Um, but at the end of the day, as you can see, all those solutions that I showed you here, they're basically trade-offs. It's a desperate effort to try to actually make immutable structures perform near mutable. So I will always, at the end of the day, if I can, go for immutable. But there are moments where you need to actually consider and be aware of the trade-offs. If you want to try this and see how it looks by your own hands, you have basically two options, at least in the, in the Java space. You can naturally go for, uh, for Haskell, Scala, and others, and you can find in standard libraries solutions like this. But if you want to play with Java, you can go for Waver uh, or Cyclops. Uh, Waver's collections, they mirror Scala collections. Cyclops, it has their own, and it's based on uh, old-school P collections. Um, and this is how we slowly arrive to the end of this presentation. And I'd like to quickly summarize what I tried to show, what was the point of all of that. Um, so the first thing that you need to remember about is that the key to efficiency when, at least from the other side of people that implement immutable data structures, is this quest for minimizing the copying and maximizing structural sharing. It also turns out that quite often simple solutions will beat complex, smart um, data structures. You know, they are great, they are great achievements of modern computer science, but at the end of the day, it still needs to be run on a machine that's, that's just a machine. And it will do much better with a very simple solution than overly complex, grotesque, and complicated one. And as you can see, immutability won't save you from all of that. It won't make your concurrency problems go away. Wait, some, some way it will, but you still need to keep that in mind. Uh, and probably this is not what the, sol the solution that you uh, want to use. So remember that trade-offs are everywhere. If you, in your currency, I, I am not able to tell you which actually is the right one. If you, I don't go out of the session and don't think, go, you, you, I will, I'm just rewriting everything to mutable structures. No, don't do that. There are certain places where you might consider, if you go for immutable, you prioritize, let's say, correctness, safety, and defensive approach. But there are cases where you prioritize more. Actually, for example, performance. Then you might slowly gravitate towards another solution. And this is what you need to keep in mind while developing stuff. And for the very end, there's a list of things that you should... If, if you got you interested, there are a few papers that you can go through to familiarize yourself with multiple variants of structures like this. We went today basically through, through the bunkers queue, we went through the, uh, we went for a simple tree, we went for hash RI mapped try. Um, pretty much most, like 90% of persistent data structures out there, they rehash all those ideas that I showed you. So they will, they will either experiment with pulling, element, pulling nodes up to the sides, they will pull, pull, throw in arrays with hashes, whatever, they will, they will mix it, and then you have the whole spectrum of all possible persistent data structures that you can get out there. And the last one is actually a very interesting one from Alexei Shipilev about how moving GCs can actually improve locality, which can be also the case here. In certain cases, it can turn out that if your application, your application with a garbage collector can run faster than without. And Alexei is showing how it turns out when, 
when he was benchmarking um, Epsilon and some other moving GC. It turns out that moving, the application was performing better while the moving GC was actually turned on, which is very interesting. Um, so thank you very much. I hope that you learned something. If not, just write me. And thank you very much. And I think we have some time for questions. Thank you. So the first question is, do we have any immutable annotation in Java? If not, is it possible to implement such, func such, such functionality? Well, we don't, and yes, it is. So, um, wait a second, I will try to put answer questions here. But now I don't see them, which is problematic. Um, so yes, of course, we can implement this, but it's not something natively supported by uh, JDK. If you really want to try something like this, there's a tool called Immutables that do something like that. You create your own interfaces, you annotate them with Immutable, and based on this, you get Immutable implementations uh, auto-generated. Does the time overhead of persistent data structures compare to the cost of hitting the network? Um, example, our database. Um, it depends. If the data structure is very, very, very big, that probably could be the case, but in most cases, I would assume no. So if you have a clear separation in your application, if you separate the domain from infrastructure, I would encourage you to still use immutability as much as possible until you break some actually limits that you can measure and not just pre-optimized before actually something like, uh, and, be, and um, I don't want you to pre-optimize stuff um, before you actually prove that, that it's needed. Is any of the GCs built into the JVM particularly well suited for working with lots of persistent data structures? Um, I would say that this is the case with all, G I mean, all GCs that actually do compact. So parallel GC, um, there's quite a few of them. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you.